Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and we're going to be studying the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. This is the very last class in terms of the Sunday talks that I do for this iteration of the group learning program, and we're going to be restarting from the very beginning on. March 17th, that it's going to be next Sunday, where I'm going to be starting from the very beginning of the group learning program, walking you guys through chapter by chapter of this book, developing a life practice, the path that leads to enlightenment. That's going to be each Sunday, and then on Wednesday, as I'm going to be teaching meditation and opening up to any and all questions that you guys have each Wednesday. Of course, you can attend. On Sunday and Wednesday, live from 9 a.m. or at 9 p.m. And where you miss the live class, you can attend through the recording, either on Facebook, YouTube, or on the podcast. So I'd like to welcome all of you guys to our very last class here. This topic of the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment is a very interesting one, as are all the teachings of the Buddha. Very interesting that. Over the last six and a half months, I've been teaching you how to get to enlightenment through the original teachings of the Buddha, the original words of the Buddha, helping you to build this foundation and this framework to be able to develop your life practice, where you can move the mind to this enlightened mental state, where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, where you're no longer experiencing any anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. Any loneliness or boredom, the shyness, the resentment, the jealousy, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the mind. You'll notice that there's focus, concentration, clarity, and deep memory. You'll notice that your personal, professional relationships really blossom. You won't even be in a bad mood anymore. You'll get to the point where all the conditions that are causing the bad mood have been eradicated from the mind, so you're always in a good mood. But in order to do that, you need to learn and build a really nice foundation, and then. Build upon that through additional learning as well, and that's what I've been doing for the last six and a half months. In this group learning program, is helping you to build that life practice. Now, what I'm going to be doing with this last class is I'm going to be sharing with you the five things that can hinder you from being able to experience that enlightened mental state. The Buddha teaches what's called the five. Hindrances. These are obstructions or obstacles to your enlightenment. And then I'm going to be sharing with you the seven factors of enlightenment as well to be able to help you to apply the antidotes or the solutions to eradicate the five hindrances from the mind. As long as these five hindrances are there in the mind, the mind will be obstructed from being able to experience that brightness and radiance of the enlightened mind. Keep in mind, if you've been learning with me for any period of time, or maybe if you're brand new, this will be something new for you. Is that you shouldn't believe any of the teachings of the Buddha. The teachings of the Buddha aren't about believing a bunch of things and then hoping something good happens when you die. Instead, you're learning his teachings, you're reflecting on them to independently verify them, and you're practicing them. You're not believing a bunch of things and hoping something good happens when you die. Instead, you're learning now, reflecting now, and practicing now, so that you can experience the results now. The Buddha didn't teach the way the world should be through various rules and commandments. And if everybody follows those rules and commandments, then the world will become more and more peaceful. Instead, he's explaining to you the way the world is. Because as long as you don't understand the world that you live in, you're going to struggle. You're going to have difficulties. That's what the sadness, the anger, the frustration, and all those other discontent feelings are there for. They're alerting you that there's some wisdom that you don't have yet, and that you need to cultivate some more wisdom in the mind to be able to eradicate. Those from the mind, so that's like the red light on the dashboard of your car telling you, "Hey, something's wrong here. You got to pop the hood and you got to."
got to check the engine and figure out what's going on. So as long as you're experiencing those discontent feelings, the mind is not yet fully cultivated the wisdom that it needs to fully eradicate them. So therefore, you need to understand more and more of the teachings to be able to learn, reflect, and practice. And now what the Buddha is doing through his teachings is explaining to you the way the world is. He's explaining to you the natural laws of existence, where at one time you didn't understand the natural law of gravity. And just like you don't understand the natural law of gravity when you're growing up and you're young, you don't understand these natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught either. And when your mind's not understanding, you'll struggle and you have difficulties. There's no being or entity that turns these natural laws on or off. These natural laws are affecting you whether you're aware of it or not. So just like the natural law of gravity, there's nobody turning it on or off and it's going to affect you whether you're aware of it or not. Slowly but surely, you cultivated wisdom of the natural law of gravity. And now you're at a point where you can navigate the world wisely. That when you lacked wisdom, you naturally made unwise decisions that led to certain unwholesome results. You fell down, you hit your elbow, you hit your knees. Maybe you broke open your knees and your elbow, you were bleeding. Maybe you broke your toys. Maybe you broke other things and you cried and you struggled and you having difficulty with this natural law of gravity because you lacked wisdom and you were making unwise decisions. But slowly but surely, you made wiser and wiser decisions because you started cultivating wisdom. You started tying your shoes a bit tighter. You started looking at the surface of the sidewalk where you were walking. You stopped being so giddy and jumping around all the time. And now you can climb a ladder. You can ride a bicycle. You can get on airplanes and go all over the place because you fully awoke to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. So that's what you're doing with all these teachings that you're learning with the Buddhist teachings is that you're not believing his teachings. You're learning, reflecting, independently verifying practice so that you can see the truth and get to wisdom. So as I teach you today, these five hindrances in the seven factors of enlightenment, I don't suggest that you believe anything that I share. It's not wise to believe something because with belief, you don't know what's true or false. So don't ever believe anything I say. Don't ever believe anything that I write in books. Don't believe anything that you see me post in the Facebook group or anything that you see from me. Don't believe it at all. Instead, learn it, reflect on it to verify it, and then practice it to be able to see the truth for yourself. And this is where your mind will gradually awaken more and more to that peace and that calm, serenity, and contentedness with joy. The teachings of the Buddha, as you're learning them, you'll see these significant improvement to the condition of your mind gradually over time you'll see in situations where you're once angry and frustrated and bitter and harsh that you no longer have those feelings anymore that your mind is quite peaceful and quite calm and this is how you know you're headed in the right direction the teachings of the buddha are very unique in this way that as i mentioned you're not believing a bunch of things and hoping something good happens when you die instead you're seeing the results now in this life because you know the situations where you once were experiencing frustration or agitation or some other discontent feeling. And when you're not experiencing that anymore, you'll know that it's from these teachings. So here, what I'm going to explain to you are the five hindrances of things that are going to hinder you from being able to experience the enlightened mental state. And then when you understand what these are and you understand how to fix them or how to remedy them, then you'll be able to go in and almost surgically remove these over time. That as you apply what the Buddha teaches you, you'll be able to apply those teachings and those tools and techniques, and then you'll be able to get liberated from these hindrances and these obstructions. So just to get us started, I'm going to share with you some words of the Buddha, which I typically like to do to be able to help you see that the Buddha did indeed teach the five hindrances. The teachings of the Buddha are in what's called the Pali Canon. This is the original source teachings of the Buddha. There are 45 books that are about 10 centimeters thick or about four or five inches thick. And you can see his original teachings in there. The book series that I share consolidates this into a manageable, digestible content that you can digest over a period of time in 13 different books. But here I've extracted some of the words of the Buddha on the five hindrances so you can have confidence that the Buddha did indeed teach these five hindrances. And then I'm going to take you into learning about the seven factors of enlightenment and the five hindrances. So here the Buddha says, monks, there are these five hindrances. What five? The hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of complacency, the hindrance of restlessness and worry, the hindrance of doubt, 
These are the five hindrances. This noble eightfold path is to be developed for direct knowledge, experience, of these five hindrances, for the full understanding of them, for their complete destruction, for their abandoning. And there you have the reference. This reference is what takes you back to the original source teaching. So if you would like to confirm that what I'm sharing is indeed from the Pali Canon, you can go back to this reference by putting it into Google or any other place that you're accessing the teachings online. You can access this particular teaching and you can see that this is indeed what the Buddha was documented to have said. So what the Buddha is doing here is just generally mentioning the five hindrances. There's other places in his teachings where he mentions the five hindrances and he talks about them in more detail. But in this particular teaching, it's just kind of mentioning what they are. And then he's mentioning kind of a general solution to this, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is like eight individual dials that you dial into your life more and more. This is the path to enlightenment. This is what an individual who's interested in getting to enlightenment would need to learn inside and out, backwards and forwards, left, right, up, down. This is why when I start the group learning program, I start with diving really deeply into the Eightfold Path, and then we cover it at different times throughout the group learning program. So over the last six and a half months, I've been teaching the Eightfold Path and a whole lot of other teachings. So if you've been in the group learning program, you've already learned this, or if you've learned with my other resources, you've already learned it. But you need to dial this in closer and closer because without the Eightfold Path being on board, you wouldn't be able to apply the new things that I'm gonna be teaching you today about how to eliminate the five hindrances. So it's important to deeply understand the Eightfold Path and develop that more and more. And if you haven't learned that yet with me, you'll be able to start learning it when we restart the group learning program coming up next week. And then if you would like to learn it before then, I have recordings on YouTube, on Facebook, and on our podcast. You can get the book, you can get the audio book, and you can start learning the Eightfold Path because that's gonna need to be a baseline foundational teaching. Just like you have speaker system and you might have eight individual dials that you're tweaking in order to get a better and better sound out of these speakers, the Eightfold Path is the same way that there's eight factors that you're dialing into your life and you're tweaking these more and more, refining it more and more in your life so that as you bring the Eightfold Path up in your life more and more and more, this is where you're noticing the pollution is being eliminated from the mind. And you'll notice that all those different qualities that I mentioned about enlightenment starting to shine through more and more as you're eliminating these pollutions. So this gives you the confidence that the Buddha did indeed teach the five hindrances and it's the Eightfold Path that is the generalized training that you would like to employ in order to make your way to enlightenment through eradicating these five hindrances. But now what I'm gonna do is just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of the five hindrances and kind of like how they relate to some other teachings before we move into the seven factors of enlightenment and some other things and actually discussing the five hindrances themselves. So the five hindrances have some similarities to the 10 fetters. The way the Buddha teaches is he teaches in this layered approach and there's this interconnectivity between a lot of the teachings where when you first start on the journey to enlightenment, you learn about the four noble truths. This is kind of giving you a window into the unenlightened mind. He's explaining to you the problem, the cause of the problem, the elimination of the problem, and the path forward. And when you understand those four noble truths and you independently reflect on them and start practicing, you can come away with understanding that it's your own mind that's causing their discontentedness due to craving, desire, attachment. All those discontent feelings are being caused by your own mind. It's not being caused by other people. So once you learn the Four Noble Truths, you then go a bit deeper where you broaden your understanding and you go deeper by understanding the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. This is craving, anger, and ignorance. And I taught that in this program as part of chapter eight. And then you start learning the 10 fetters. These are the 10 individual pollutions. This is the most detailed description of what the Buddha is sharing with you that are the problems in the unenlightened mind. But rather than start in the weeds and start down in the detail, he starts you with the Four Noble Truths, then you go into the Three Poisons or the Three Unwholesome Roots, then you go into the Ten Fetters. 
They're called fetters because during ancient times, when they had prisoners, they would put a fetter around their ankle to keep them trapped in a particular area. What a fetter is, is a shackle with a chain and a ball, and it would keep you confined to a certain area. Where nowadays we put people in jail cells, where back then they might just have been in an open field, and they'd have a shackle, a chain, and a ball around their ankle that would keep them confined to a certain area. So the 10 fetters are 10 individual pollutions or taints or defilements that are keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. And it's through learning and practicing the Eightfold Path that eliminates the 10 fetters. And you'll need to learn and practice the seven factors of enlightenment as well. This is going to eliminate the 10 fetters and also eliminate the five hindrances as well. Gautama Buddha's teachings are oftentimes pointing to each other either indirectly or in direct ways that you'll see this kind of overlap. An example might be like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts. These are all interconnected teachings that one kind of layers on top of each other and they kind of interconnect with each other. So you're going to see that here with the five hindrances, that four out of the five hindrances are actually part of the ten fetters. But now they're going to be kind of cast in a different way where you're understanding them as hindrances or obstructions to your enlightenment. So the struggles and impediments on the path to enlightenment is these five hindrances. These are the things that can obstruct the mind or create blocks so that you're unable to progress forward on the path to enlightenment. It's through eliminating and removing these hindrances that you can then create progress on the path to enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment are the solutions to these hindrances. In some cases, you're going to see that you need to apply the seven factors of enlightenment. And I kind of introduced these a little bit earlier in the program, way back at the beginning. But here at the end, I would like to teach them to you because the seven factors of enlightenment are a way to fine tune the mind. You need to fine tune it. Sometimes when people see the name, the seven factors of enlightenment, they think this is to determine whether you are enlightened or you aren't enlightened. But in reality, what these are is they're to fine tune the mind. If you think about like a sculpture if you were going to make a beautiful sculpture of a human being out of a chunk of raw wood like a log when you first get started on the sculpture you'd probably use a hatchet or an axe to chunk off a bunch of big chunks off of this big log and as you chunk off of the, a lot of those big chunks eventually when you get down closer and closer to where it is that you're going to be sculpting this human being out of this raw piece of wood you're going to be using finer tools, maybe like a razor blade or exacto knife or something like this in order to put the wrinkles around the eyes or around the lips or something like this to show that fine detail. Well, becoming enlightened and this path to enlightenment is very similar to making the sculpture out of this raw piece of wood. You're using your hatchet or your axe to chuck off the big chunks of wood early on. So you're learning things on the Eightfold Path early on in your journey to enlightenment where you're learning right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So chucking off these big chunks of wood early on is like chucking off wrong view and wrong intention, and wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and wrong concentration. You're chucking that off and getting down smaller and smaller down to something that's more manageable with this sculpture or with creating this better and better human being that you're w looking to become as you make your way to enlightenment. But then eventually you're going to need to use a different tool because if you've got the Eightfold Path well underway and you're practicing that, you're going to need to come in with a different tool in order to fine tune the mind. And that's what the seven factors of enlightenment are. They're the fine tune the mind. And you're going to see a little bit of overlap here, particularly with the first factor where the Buddha teaches mindfulness is the first factor. In other words, this is one of the first tools you need in order to fine tune your mind is you need to practice mindfulness. And this is the exact same mindfulness from the Eightfold Path. In the Eightfold Path, I taught you that when you're first starting to understand mindfulness, you can think about it as awareness of mind. 
where you just have this general awareness of what's going on in the mind. Because typically when you're off the path to enlightenment or you're first starting the path to enlightenment, you don't understand and don't have awareness of what's going on in the mind. You might be having all these different feelings and different experiences and you just don't have any kind of awareness of what's going on in your own mind. So initially, as you're starting your meditation practice and you're practicing in daily life, you would like to build this general awareness of the mind. That's what mindfulness means, is awareness of the mind. But then more and more closely, you would like to start developing what's referred to as the four foundations of mindfulness. This is where you're really going to be able to transform the mind. We talked about this when we talked about the Eightfold Path, but here I'm going to describe it for you some more. What the four foundations of mindfulness are is where you understand that there's bodily sensations, there's feelings, there's the condition of the mind, and there's mental objects. The Buddha is describing to you the life cycle that discontentedness is going to take when you have craving, desire, attachment in the mind. When you have certain cravings, longing, and yearning, and wanting things to be a certain way, if you get what you want, you'll get pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But when you don't get what you want, you're going to get painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. This is all based on the mind's craving, desire, attachment because the mind is seeing certain things as agreeable, and when you get that agreeable contact through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, or the mind, you'll experience the conditioned pleasant feelings. Based on the condition of experiencing something that you find agreeable, you will experience those pleasant feelings. Happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But then, because of craving, desire, attachment in the mind, you'll experience these painful feelings. The sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. This is because the mind is craving for things to be a certain way and it's not getting what it wants. So it sees this contact as disagreeable. That when you see things through the eyes or you hear things through the ear or smell things through the nose, you taste certain flavors, you have certain bodily contact or you have certain things going through your mind, if you find it to be disagreeable, you will then experience the painful feelings in the mind. So prior to the feelings coming into the mind, you're going to experience bodily sensations. This is the first foundation of mindfulness. If you have maybe thought about this or you can think about a situation where you've been angry or frustrated, these bodily sensations are things like tingling in the body as anger is about to arise. You might notice tightening in the chest or pain in the heart. You might notice tightening in your throat or you might notice heat in your face or pressure in your skull. These are all bodily sensations associated with the anger or frustration or irritation or annoyance that is arising. This is like an early warning system where you can take action. You can cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation. Because if you don't, it's then going to affect the condition of, I'm sorry, it's then going to become a feeling. It's going to now enter into the mind as a feeling of anger or frustration. Now you've got that feeling. That's the second foundation of mindfulness. And if you don't cut it off and let it go there, it's going to now affect the condition of the mind for a few hours or a few days or a week or so. If you've ever been angry or frustrated or agitated for a few hours, a few days or a week or so, which I'm sure you have, this is because you didn't understand that there was these bodily sensations that were occurring that you could cut off and let go. You didn't understand about the feelings coming into the mind that you could train your mind to cut that off and let it go. So now it affected the condition of your mind and you walked around grumpy and irritable for a period of time. And then it fed what's called a mental object, which is a deeply rooted container in the mind, like a mental state. So for example, right now, you're not angry, you're not upset, you're not frustrated, you're just listening to me talk. But there's this deeply rooted container in the mind called ill will. This is one of the mental objects. And if something happens in your life in terms of a certain craving gets triggered and you find that to be disagreeable, now this ill will can arise out of this container of the mental object. So the Buddha is explaining to you the process that discontentedness is going through where you experience these bodily sensations of the tingling, the tightening of the chest, the heat in the face, the pressure in the skull, and you can take action here and you can cut it off and let it go. 
You're not suppressing the feelings here. You're cutting them off before they even become a feeling. It's kind of like if you were going to take a boat from South America to Africa and you're out in the middle of the sea, you would like to prevent the water from ever coming into the boat. Because once the water gets in the boat, you've got a real problem to deal with. Well, the same thing is true that if you can prevent the mind from experiencing a conditioned feeling based on some condition, then you've saved your mind. You've protected the mind. Now you can go about your day. So if you can notice the bodily sensations starting to arise associated with the cravings, desires, attachments, and now this discontentedness is arising, whether it's a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, or neither painful nor pleasant, you can cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation. And now you've preserved your mind. If you do that enough, you won't even have any arising of any discontentedness because you've eliminated the cravings, desires, attachments that are causing it. But if you miss it as a bodily sensation, because you will, you can't just intellectually learn what I'm sharing with you and then just implement it easily. It's going to take some gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress to gradually build up to the point where you can notice every single time the bodily sensations and you can cut them off and let them go. If you get to that point, enlightenment is very close. Within the next one year, two years, three years, and so on, you'll be experiencing enlightenment. If you can get to the point where you can notice those bodily sensations every single time and you can take action to cut them off every single time, and your mind is able to easily let them go, enlightenment is near. So it's going to take you a few years to build up to the point where you can experience this. And that's where the meditation comes in. The breathing mindfulness meditation isn't to eliminate your thoughts. It's to develop mindfulness and concentration and be able to easily let go, let go, let go. So when the bodily sensations are coming up, you can cut that off and let it go. But because you're going to miss it sometimes as a bodily sensation and it's going to become a feeling because your mind sometimes going to experience that on your way to enlightenment because your mind is under training, you can cut it off and let it go as a feeling. Train the mind to let go of this. And if you don't get it there and you're noticing for an hour or two or a day or two you're agitated or annoyed, you can cut it off as a condition of the mind. And this will help you to uproot the mental objects. So you're essentially putting a blockade on this at the bodily sensations so that you can work on purifying the mind and uprooting these mental objects out of the mind. When we talk about acquiring wisdom and purifying the mind on the journey to enlightenment, you're uprooting these mental objects out of the mind. All the five hindrances are mental objects. The 10 fetters are all mental objects and the mind needs to be purified of this. So there are certain tools to go in and actively eliminate these mental objects out of the mind. So all the while, you're interested in not feeding them anymore. You're interested in cutting that back and that's what you're doing when the bodily sensations are occurring. You know where that's going to lead. It's going to lead to some discontentedness. So you need to cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation. But again, if you miss it, cut it off as a feeling. If you miss it, as a feeling, cut it off as a condition of the mind. And eventually you'll be able to internally cut it off because you've trained enough in breathing mindfulness meditation. But in the meantime, you might need to redirect the mind. So if you're sitting on the sofa watching the news and you're noticing the frustration coming up, it's better to just turn off the news and go out for a walk or go ride a bike or something rather than sit there and dwell in that frustration as the mind is getting ready to get that conditioned feeling and it's coming together and coming together and coming together and all those bodily sensations are occurring, you'd like to dismantle that. You'd like to restrain the mind and break that up, not allowing the mind to form that conditioned feeling. Because if you keep allowing the mind to form that conditioned feeling, then it's gonna keep doing that over and over and over again. So you'd like to catch it way before it gets to that conditioned feeling and then break it up. And this is where your mindfulness comes in. You're going to need to have awareness of these four foundations of mindfulness. But you might need to just start with building general awareness of the mind. This is oftentimes where people start. And then more and more, you'd like to build these four foundations. The bodily sensations associated with discontentedness arising, the feelings, the condition of the mind, and these mental objects. And this is practicing mindfulness. And you would like to practice this from the time that you're waking up in the morning you're still laying in bed, you're still kind of groggy, your mind's just waking up, you should start getting some awareness of mind. 
all day long practicing that you're aware of the mind and what's going on in the mind. And then as you're dozing off to sleep at night, still awareness of mind because your thoughts can invade you while you're waking up in the morning or you're dozing off at night. You can have these intrusive thoughts that are invading the mind. And where you see that, you'd like to cut it off and let it go. That will purify the mind. So if you're practicing mindfulness at all times, what you're going to notice is in some situations, your mind is going to be sluggish or dull or lethargic. And when that's the case, you would like to practice the enlightenment factors of investigation, energy, and joy. This is what's going to uplift the mind and bring it to the middle. What the enlightenment factor of investigation is, is where you have dedicated examination, exploration, research, study, that you're having questions to learn the teachings of the Buddha on the path to enlightenment. Because when the mind's dull or lethargic or sluggish, the last thing you're going to be interested in doing is picking up a book to read the teachings of the Buddha or coming to a class or coming to the temple or meditating or reaching out to your teacher for help because the mind is dull and lethargic. So you're going to need this dedicated examination of the teachings, which is investigating the teachings. You're going to need to arise that. What I suggest that you do is develop a practice where every day, about 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, you're reading a little bit of these books. And I suggest starting with volume one. They're just 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. You're not interested in reading for an hour or two because this is like taking a big bite of pizza and trying to chew it. It's really hard to digest it. You'd like to take little bites and just chew a little bit and swallow and then give yourself 24 hours or so to be thinking about and reflecting on what it is that you read. Where if you take a big dose of the teachings, it's really hard for the mind to digest that and retain it. So just little by little, investigating the teachings by reading 10, 15, 20 minutes a day and coming to classes, reaching out for help and things like that. As you're doing that, the mind is going to take some time to get out of that complacency. It's not going to be five minutes. It's not going to be maybe even 30 minutes. It might not even be one or two days. But gradually, slowly but surely, you eradicate this sluggishness, this dullness, this lethargic condition through investigating the teachings. And over a period of time, you'll notice that the mind will be uplifted where there will be this energy that comes into the mind because you're finally getting the true teachings that you need to eradicate these pollutions. So as you're eradicating these pollutions out of the mind, you'll notice this enlightenment factor of energy starting to spring up in the mind where you'll be willing to apply effort, determination, ambition, initiative. You'll have motivation, this vigor in the mind, this enthusiasm and willingness to do something, that you'll be willing to have initiative to actually do something instead of being dull and lethargic and sitting around. And then you'll notice that as this energy is springing up in the mind, there'll be this joy where the mind will be pleased and delighted, not associated with any specific object. It's unconditioned gladness where the practitioner isn't attaining it by way of craving, desire, attachment. It's just this unconditioned joy that will start springing up in the mind. Again, it's not going to be a one day thing or maybe even a one week thing. It's going to take you time to gradually build up your practice where you're regularly investigating the teachings and that's going to bring the mind out of that sluggish, dull state. Then in other situations, you're going to notice that the mind is excited and overactive. When you're noticing that, you would like to calm the mind down. You'd like to bring it down because allowing the mind to be in that excited state isn't going to be beneficial for you. When the mind is dull or when it's excited, you're not able to make wise decisions. So when you're noticing your mind's in that overactive, excited state, you'd like to bring in the tranquility, the concentration, and the equanimity. That's what's going to calm it down and bring it to the middle. You're going to need to apply effort to be able to do this and rise all of these seven factors of enlightenment. Tranquility is where the mind's relaxed, steady, stable. There's some peacefulness and stillness in the mind. This is going to help calm it down out of that excited state. You're going to need to know how to invoke that when you need it. Then you're going to need to have concentration, which is mental alertness, attentiveness, being able to give your thought to a single object. This is the same concentration from the Eightfold Path when you practice singleness of mind, being able to do just one thing at a time rather than allowing the mind to bounce around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing because that's what it's going to do when it's in that excited state. It's going to want to bounce around. So where you see that occurring, you bring the concentration in. Of course, the tranquility, but you bring that concentration in where your mind can be focused and do just one thing at a time.
And then you'd like to bring in this equanimity, which is the mental calmness and composure, evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. Because when your mind's all shaken up, you're not able to make wise decisions. So for example, if you got a phone call that your mom had been in a terrible car accident and she's in the back of an ambulance on her way to the hospital, well, if you're attached to your mom and you're craving for her to be permanently healthy, you might grab your car keys, jump in the car and run across town. Well, you could get in a car accident yourself because your mind is uncalm. You don't have mindfulness or awareness of mind. You don't have concentration and you're not making wise decisions through your wisdom. You're making unwise decisions that's producing unwholesome results. You can get in a car accident yourself. But at the very least, when you show up to the hospital, as the doctors and nurses are talking to you, you're not going to be able to focus on what it is that they have to say to be able to make some wise decisions to help your mom. So if you allow your mind to be in that excited state that sometimes people crave that, that is very unwise because your mind is firing there based on these conditioned feelings and you're not able to access your wisdom because the mind is uncalm so it lacks mindfulness it doesn't have concentration and you can't access your wisdom and you're going to start making unwise decisions that is producing unwholesome results but when you can bring in the tranquility the concentration the equanimity this will calm the mind down and now with that calmness you can have mindfulness or awareness of mind you can have concentration and you can access your wisdom and you know that mom being in the back of that ambulance is the best place for her she's got emergency medical technicians taking care of her she's about to arrive to a hospital with doctors and nurses and equipment there's nothing that you're going to be able to do to help her in that situation running across town isn't going to help her it's only going to make matters worse so if you can keep your mind calm, you can see the clarity in that and just take your time to gradually make your way to the hospital. And then when you show up, you've got presence of mind and you can listen to the doctors, you can listen to the nurses, you can understand what's happening. And now you can make some wise decisions that's gonna help your mom, right? So this is what you would like to do is not allow the mind to be up in that excited state. Essentially what you're doing is by bringing the mind in the middle like this, you're training it and disciplining it so that more and more it'll stay in the middle. It's kind of like if you had a piece of wood and you had a steel rod and you were grinding this back and forth, back and forth. When you first start, the steel rod's going to be bouncing around all over the place because there's no groove yet. But as you grind this steel rod back and forth on the wood, you'll start getting a bit of a groove into the wood. And occasionally it's going to pop out, but you're going to notice it and be able to bring it back. But eventually you grind this steel rod back and forth on the wood enough, you're going to get a deep enough groove that it won't pop out. It's going to just stay in that groove. So your mind is the same way. If you can be practicing this mindfulness and awareness of mind, and wherever you see the mind is dull and lethargic or sluggish, you can lift it up with some investigation, energy, and joy, keeping that ongoing and consistent. And then when you see it excited and overactive, if you can bring it down with some tranquility, concentration, and equanimity, more and more your mind will be in the middle and you'll get this groove where the mind will just be focused and it'll be harder and harder for it to pop out. And when it does pop out, you'll notice it and bring it back. But eventually your mind will be in that groove for such a long period of time, it won't pop out. You can just always be focused and clear. And this is where the mind's getting closer and closer to enlightenment. And this is how you fine tune the mind with these seven factors of enlightenment. Item. So let me see what questions you guys have here. You can ask those by putting them into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move into teaching you the five hindrances. These first three, and then I'll stop and ask for questions and then I'll teach the following two and stop and ask for questions there. So these are the obstructions or the hindrances or the obstacles that are going to keep the mind from progressing on the path to enlightenment. And as I mentioned, four out of the five are actually fetters, but now we're talking about them more as, as obstructions. When I teach the retreat in August, there's going to be a retreat that I teach that is going to help you to understand these 10 fetters. I'm going to go through and I'm going to explain each individual fetter. I'm going to explain what the fetter is, 
the symptoms that you're experiencing, the tools and techniques to eliminate it, and then I'm gonna explain how to know when you've actually eliminated. I'm gonna go into these in a lot of detail, but here, I'm gonna just get right to the heart of it and kind of explain it to you and help you understand how to remedy it. And then in August, you'll be able to learn a lot more detail around the 10 fetters, which as I mentioned, four of these are actual fetters. So the first one here is central desire. This is an obstruction, this is a hindrance. This is gonna block you from getting to enlightenment. What central desire is, is where the mind is trying to please itself through receiving contact through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind itself. That there's this longing and yearning that the mind has, that it wants permanently agreeable contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body and the mind. And then if you get what you want, if you get what you find agreeable and you expect, then the mind's gonna experience those pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But if you don't get what you want, you're gonna get the painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, and other painful feelings. So this central desire is where the mind is longing and yearning, wanting things to be permanently agreeable. So for example, if you're walking down the street and you see something like a parent holding the hand of their child, you might think, oh, that's so sweet. Look at the mom and dad holding their child's hand. That's so beautiful. I really like that. And you get all these pleasant feelings from that based on the condition that you see something that is agreeable to you. But now when you turn the corner and you see a parent slap their child across the face, if this is disagreeable to you, you'll experience painful feelings like anger, sadness, and frustration. Now remember, I'm not explaining the way the world should be. What I'm doing is explaining to you the way the world is. And the way the world is, is that you can't control what other people do. And there's this impermanence that some parents are gonna treat their children in the way that I mentioned in the first way. And there's gonna be some parents who treat their children in the way that I mentioned in the second way, where they might slap their child across the face. And you can't control that. All you can do is control your own mind. So if you have this longing yearning through the eyes to see permanently agreeable forms, then when you see something agreeable, you'll get pleasant feelings. <clears throat> when you see something disagreeable, you'll get painful feelings. Let's take something a little bit more simple with the eyes. Let's say you look outside and you see it's sunny outside. Yay, it's sunny outside. Oh, so excited, yay. I'm gonna go hiking, I'm gonna go see my friends. Yay, we're gonna go play outside. Based on seeing something that's agreeable to you, which is the sun, you might get so excited, happy, elated. Now you go take a shower and you come outside and now you see something that's disagreeable to you. You see the rain, right? And now when you see the rain, you might be frustrated or agitated or annoyed. This is because you're seeing something through the eyes that is disagreeable. And the mind is not getting its central desire fulfilled. It's not getting agreeable contact through the eyes. It's getting this disagreeable contact where it sees the rain. And now it's frustrated or agitated or annoyed. Or here's another example. Say you hear some music through the ears. You're at a stoplight in your car and somebody pulls up to you with music that you particularly like. And you're like, all right, that's my jam. Yeah, let's go. Come on, you're bopping around in your seat. You're so excited. And, and then the light turns green. You pull up to the next light. It's a red light. And now somebody else pulls up to you with music that you don't like. You hear this sound and you just despise this music. Well, what the mind will typically do in that case is it'll blame the other person. It'll think that the problem is the other person. And you might push this person aside. You might be bitter, harsh, and hostile. You might try to put your expectations on people. This is what the unenlightened mind does when its cravings, desires, attachments aren't getting fulfilled. You might be bitter and harsh and hostile to this person. But what's really causing that frustration is your cravings, desires, attachments because you can't permanently get agreeable contact through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. There's all these sense bases. Now say you're walking down the street and you're just kind of walking on a sidewalk by yourself. You might find this to be agreeable, but then somebody bumps into you 
and now their contact with the body, maybe you find this to be disagreeable and you get frustrated or agitated or annoyed because this is disagreeable to you. This is the central desire. Or say you have some fabric that you particularly like that touches the skin and that you're wearing this as clothing and you get happy when you're wearing this clothing. But now maybe you have a different type of fabric that you wear and you don't like this fabric and you get agitated or annoyed by this fabric. This is because of the central desire. The mind is longing and yearning. You might be wanting people to be permanently polite and kind and friendly and respectful to you. And when people do that, you might be getting these pleasant feelings. But then when people are impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, you're getting angry and frustrated and bitter and harsh. You're thinking that they are the ones who are causing you to be angry. But that's not true. That's not the true reality. The true reality is that it's your central desire, that the mind's longing, yearning, and craving for things to be a certain way in the world, and you're wanting that permanence, and you can't get it because you live in an impermanent world. And when this person's bitter, harsh, and hostile, you might push them aside. This is called aversion, but it doesn't solve the problem because it's only a matter of time before you get agitated or annoyed again. If that was the problem and you pushing someone aside is going to solve the problem, you wouldn't get angry or irritated again because you've solved the problem. But when you push that person away out of your life, you get angry or agitated or annoyed again. Or you might become bitter and harsh and hostile to that person. Or you might put your expectations on that person, trying to control them to do things your way. And as long as your mind's misunderstanding what the real problem is, that it's this central desire, you'll keep pushing people away. You'll be bitter, harsh, and hostile. You'll put your expectations on people. And the number of people that you can spend time with becomes fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. As your cravings, desires, attachments, your expectations, and your wants grow, your amount of happiness goes smaller and smaller and smaller because it's only a matter of time before somebody does something that you disagree with, that you find to be disagreeable, and now you become angered or frustrated. So you can eradicate all this from the mind by eliminating your central desire. But as long as you have this central desire, it's gonna hinder you from progressing to enlightenment. So say, for example, you have central desire where you're holding on to beer or wine, and this beer and wine is causing the mind to be heedless, and now, your desire to taste that flavor, you're holding on to it and you don't want to let it go because of that central desire. This is going to obstruct you from getting to enlightenment. It's going to hinder you because as long as you're holding on to that substance that's causing heedlessness, your mind is not going to be able to be trained to have mindfulness and awareness of mind. It's not going to be able to move into this enlightened mental state. Or say you're holding on to sexual activity where when you have sex, you feel pleasant feelings. But when you don't have sex, you feel agitated or annoyed or frustrated. As long as you're holding on to any kind of central pleasures, the mind's going to be obstructed and having these obstacles towards getting to enlightenment. So you're going to need to gradually shed this central desire. It's not something you can do in one day or one week or one month or even one year. It's going to take you time to gradually train the mind to shed away its central desire. It's almost like peeling an onion and peeling back the layers more and more. So the way that you eliminate the central desire is with the elimination of craving desire attachment using breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity. Breathing mindfulness meditation is where you're focused on the breath and anytime the mind moves off the breath, you cut that off and let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. So if 20, 30, 50 times during your meditation, you need to let go and let go and let go and let go, this is really, really good for you. Always keep in mind your goal isn't to eliminate your thoughts in meditation. It's to be aware when they've occurred and to cut them off and let them go as soon as possible. And of course, you're developing concentration and singleness of mind as well. So a consistent, ongoing breathing mindfulness meditation will accumulate into the benefits of training the mind to let go and no longer crave permanence and crave agreeable contact. So now when you're walking through the mall and you see that brand new pair of shoes and you're like, yes, 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 new pair of shoes. I can't wait to get them. Oh my goodness. Yes, 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 yes. You see that with your mindfulness. You see the craving, the longing, the yearning, or maybe new piece of jewelry or new boyfriend or new girlfriend, or maybe a new phone or a computer craving, longing, yearning, you know your mind's going to end up in those conditioned pleasant feelings and then it's only a matter of time before you end up in the painful feelings. Because if you get that brand new phone, you get so excited with it, but then when you lose it, 
when you misplace it, when it gets broken, if somebody steals it, you're going to be frustrated and annoyed and angry. So it's only a matter of time if you allow your mind to base decisions on craving, desire, attachment, that it's going to end up in those painful feelings. So when you see the mind longing and yearning, you can restrain it. Your meditation is training you to get the ability to restrain your mind in daily life. So you'd like this consistent ongoing meditation practice of two or three sessions of 30 minutes or more. And you'd like to gradually build up to that. It's going to take you maybe six months, a year, two years to gradually build up to that point where you can be meditating consistently and that the mind is absorbing the meditation and absorbing the training and trained to let go. Then you would like to practice generosity where you're training the mind to give and share more than is strictly required in any given situation without any expectation of anything in return. Because when your mind has craving, desire, attachment, it will oftentimes be somewhat selfish. You'll hold on to things very tightly. So when you're practicing generosity, where you're sharing your clothes, your food, your financial resources, maybe your home, you have friends or family that need a place to stay, other things like this, you can be sharing and you can give and share without any expectation of anything in return. This is going to train your mind to let go. So now when you see when you're out and about and your mind is longing and yearning, you can cut off and let go if you've been training with breathing mindfulness, meditation, and generosity. So you're going to need to be doing that on a consistent ongoing basis. But then you're going to need to put your mind in situations where you're kind of testing this. So let's say you're about to buy a brand new mobile phone and you're not sure whether it has craving, desire, attachment for this mobile phone or not. What you can do is you can show up to the store and you can check out the mobile phones. Look at all the different mobile phones. Look at the features, all the prices and everything like this. Play with them a little bit. If you need to talk to the salespeople, talk to the salespeople. And then leave the store. Don't buy the phone. See how the mind experiences that. Is it agitated? Is it annoyed? Was it longing and yearning? See how it experiences that for a few days or a few weeks and then go do it again and see how the mind experiences it and keep doing that. If you need to do it two, three, four, five times until you're convinced that you're just as peaceful when you're looking at the phone and considering to buy it as you are when you leave, that your mind is just as peaceful and joyful, that there isn't no up and down based on the excitement to go see these new phones and then there's not this agitation or disgruntledness when you leave and you didn't get the phone. So you can do this with not just a mobile phone, but any kind of purchases, because usually a big purchase is usually going to have craving, desire, attachment in the unenlightened state. So as you're doing things like that, you would like to test the mind and put it in the situation and kind of come and go. And then after three, four, five, six times, then maybe you buy your mobile phone and you'll know, okay, now you know that you're buying it without craving, desire, attachment because you need this mobile phone. So now when it breaks or it stops working or you misplace it, your mind's not shaken up by that, that you've trained your mind not to hold on and be attached to this phone. Because the attachment isn't the mobile phone itself. There's no problem with the mobile phone. It's not the mobile phone. The problem is inside your own mind. That's the craving, desire, attachment. That's the longing, yearning. You can have a mobile phone and a computer and a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, children. You can have all of these things and not be attached to them. But your mind hasn't been trained to do that yet. So that's what you're in the process of doing with breathing mindfulness, meditation, and generosity, and then putting your mind in the situation that it maybe is going to experience craving, desire, attachment, and testing it out. And all the while, what you're doing is what's called guarding the doorways of discontentedness. The six doorways to discontentedness are the six sense bases. The eyes, ears, nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. Every time you've ever been discontent, you can trace it to a particular doorway or maybe more than one. You can tell that it was something that you saw that was either agreeable or disagreeable through the eyes, that you heard something through the ears that was either agreeable or disagreeable, that you smelled an odor through the nose that was either agreeable or disagreeable, that there was a certain flavor that touched the tongue, 
that was either agreeable or disagreeable, or there was some physical object that touched the body that you found either to be agreeable or disagreeable, or there was something in the mind where the mind maybe was thinking about something in the past, maybe something pleasurable that happened in the past. And now you're wanting to recreate that now in the present moment. And because you don't have that thing from the past, now in the present moment, you're experiencing the anger, the sadness or frustration. Say you were really rich or wealthy in the past, and now you don't have very many resources. You might be longing, yearning for whatever you had in the past, and now you can't be peaceful and joyful in the present moment because you're experiencing painful feelings because the mind's longing and yearning for something that it had in the past. Or maybe you're excited about something in the future. Maybe you're going on a trip somewhere and you get so excited three months, six months before, and you're so excited to go. But then you show up to the airport and now the flight's canceled or the flight's delayed. And now you're frustrated or agitated or annoyed. This is because of the sense base of the mind, that the mind's longing and yearning for something. So you would like to guard these doorways to discontent and is realizing that any contact through these doorways has the potential to produce discontentedness if you have craving, desire, attachment in the mind. So I'll give you an example of how I've guarded the doorways to discontentedness in the past, where one time I was working to eliminate the craving for coffee because I knew that this drinking coffee and this caffeine was taking the mind in this excited state, so I needed to get rid of this coffee. So I would go three, four, five days without coffee, and I would end up having a coffee. And I would go one or two weeks without coffee, and then I'd end up having a coffee. Maybe three or four or five weeks, and then I'd end up having a coffee. One time I went eight weeks without having a coffee, and I thought that this craving was gone. I was actually quite pleased with myself. I was like, wow, look at this. I got rid of this craving. This is wonderful. But after eight weeks of not having a coffee, I was walking down the street, and the aroma of the coffee came into the nose and I smelt that odor, which I found to be agreeable because there was still some craving in the mind. And I went right into the coffee shop. I was standing there in line, there was people in front of me, and I was telling myself, why are you doing this? This is so crazy, you're gonna have a headache for doing this, you're gonna be hating yourself, you know, you're gonna be laying in bed for a couple of days with a headache, why are you doing this? And I got up to the front of the line and the lady said, what would you like? And I ordered and I got my order and I sat down and I started drinking on the the coffee. And I was like, all right, this is it. After about a third or half of the cup, I just threw it away and I said, no more. I'm not having any more coffee. And that was my last coffee several years ago. But then realizing what had happened is that this odor had entered the nose and I wasn't guarding my doorways. I started guarding my doorways. That when I started walking down the street and I would see a coffee shop, I would switch to the other side of the street. And I needed to do this for a period of time to guard my doorways, to give my mind enough time to distance itself from the coffee so that it could eliminate the craving, desire, attachment. And by going to the other side of the street, I was able to guard my doorways that I didn't allow the odor to come into the nose. But now I'm at the point where that craving is long gone and I visited coffee shops where students will sometimes invite me out because they would like to talk and they have certain personal guidance that they would need and they asked me to meet them at a particular coffee shop and I'm like sure I'll meet you there but now I just order smoothies or I order a water or something like that and I can smell the coffee all day long and I know that it's an interesting smell but I don't find it to be agreeable or disagreeable there's no craving to have a cup of coffee instead I just am pleased with the smoothie or the water or sometimes maybe nothing maybe I just sit there and just talk I don't even order or anything. So you're going to need to give your mind this space by guarding the doorways to allow it to do this inner work and train the mind through breathing mindfulness, meditation, and generosity to eliminate its central desires. And you're going to need to peel these away. And as you do, the mind's going to become more and more peaceful, more and more joyful because you don't have those cravings that are producing the discontentedness any longer. Then the second hindrance or the obstruction that's going to hinder you from experiencing enlightenment is the ill will. 
This is the anger, the hatred, the hostility, the bitterness, the aggression, resentment, frustration, irritation, annoyance. This is where you have your central desire in your mind and you get your cravings fulfilled. You're going to get those pleasant feelings. But if you don't get your central desire fulfilled, there's going to be this anger, this hostility, this bitterness that comes up in the mind. This is the ill will. And now you're going to become potentially unskillful through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. This is where you might be bitter and harsh and hostile through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. And as long as you're putting that out into the world, that's what's going to come back to you. So in your relationships where you're being bitter and harsh and hostile to people, then they're going to be bitter, harsh, and hostile right back to you. And you're not going to be able to get to the peace and joyful mind because you're angry and bitter and harsh and resentful and having agitation and aggression in the mind. So if you're looking to eliminate your ill will, you need to be working on eliminating the central desire. But then there's actual training that you can eliminate this ill will from the mind. This is loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in daily life. The loving kindness meditation is essentially going to rewire the mind so that you're no longer experiencing the anger and the bitterness because this leads to broken relationships. You know where this leads is it just leads to broken relationships when you're bitter, harsh and hostile with people. And at the very least, you're experiencing all those painful feelings. So if you can use loving kindness meditation to rewire your mind to change your mind, then you can go out into the world and practice loving kindness through your intention, speech and actions. Sometimes people misunderstand loving kindness meditation. They think that your goal is to change other people through your loving kindness meditation, but that's not the case at all. There's nothing on the path to enlightenment that is about changing other people. It's all about doing your work to change your own mind and transform your own mind. So this loving kindness meditation is to transform your mind so that you can kind of build up this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. And then you can practice loving kindness in daily life through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. At one time, I had a lot of hostility and bitterness towards my mother for things that happened as I was growing up. And it was only a matter of time when we would come together that fireworks would go off. Either her or I would do things where we would be bitter, harsh, and hostile to each other. If she would pick up the rubber ball of anger and throw it around the room, I'd pick it up and throw it around the room. We'd have all these rubber balls bouncing around the room. But I decided to do something different. Because see, sometimes what we think is that other people have to change before we change. But that's not the way any of this works. You're going to need to implement the change yourself first. Because by you changing, you can then experience change and improvement in your life. So by me training my mind with loving kindness meditation, becoming more and more loving, having this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, I could speak to my mom in more loving and kind ways. Where in the past, if she was bitter and harsh and hostile with me on the phone, I'd be bitter, harsh and hostile right back. But with loving kindness meditation and transforming the mind and then practicing in daily life, when she would be bitter, harsh and hostile with me, I could say things like, Mom, I know that in the past that I've been bitter, harsh, and hostile with you, but I'm choosing to do something different now. I value this relationship more than being bitter, harsh, and hostile with you. I'd like to stop doing this. So I'm going to get off the phone and let you think about what it is that you just said. I love you, Mom. Be well. Right. And I would just get off the phone and then I wouldn't talk to her for maybe three months or six months, give her time to think about what she said. And then we would come back together and then maybe things would be fine for two months, three months, four months. And then maybe she'd be bitter, harsh and hostile. And I do the same thing again. I say, mom, I value this relationship much more than being bitter, harsh and hostile with you. I'm not interested in doing that anymore, even though I used to do that in the past. I'm going to get off the phone. I love you. Be well. We'll talk another time. And then slowly but surely, as she was noticing that David wasn't being bitter, harsh, and hostile anymore, she could see that she was the problem. Of course, I was part of the problem too, but I chose to no longer be part of the problem. I chose to improve the condition of my mind. So now she could see that it was her that needed to address that. So by the time she died in 2017, our relationship had been fine for many, many years, that there wasn't any 
bitterness or hostility or 2017 sorry about that she died in 2017 so she was able to see that it was her mind and it wasn't my mind and now slowly but surely since i made the improvements, she was able to make the improvements so this is what you would like to be doing on a consistent ongoing basis is practicing loving kindness meditation and practicing the eightfold path in terms of right intention right speech and right action so that you can improve your relationships because as long as you're putting out bitterness and harshness and hostility, it's going to be coming back to you. Then the other hindrance or obstruction that you'll experience that is going to stop you from being able to get to enlightenment is complacency. What complacency is, is dullness, lethargic condition, the lack of motivation. If you look at some of the older translations of the five hindrances, you might see this term sloth and toper. But I'm using this updated word choice, which is complacency, where there's dullness, lethargic, there's lack of motivation, there's not initiative to do something. This is related to the teachings of the Buddha, that you're complacent with your meditation, you're not interested in meditating, or you're complacent with investigating the teachings, or you're complacent in getting personal guidance with the teacher. This is all complacency. And as long as you're complacent, you're not going to be able to cultivate the wisdom and implement the teachings in your practice to be able to get to enlightenment. So the complacency is going to hinder you. It's going to be an obstruction. The Buddha talks about complacency even deeper than this, that he talks about complacency, that even if you're walking down the street and you have an unwholesome thought and you don't do anything about it, that your mind is complacent. Or say you're waking up in the morning or you're dozing off at night and you have an unwholesome or unwise thought and you don't take action to cut it off and let it go, he says your mind's complacent. So you need to eradicate complacency all the way to the point that your mindfulness is so well dialed in that anytime you see an unwholesome or unwise thought arising at any point, you take action to address it. And of course, you're going to need to eradicate complacency to build up a meditation practice, to be coming to classes, to consult with a teacher, to be reading books and things like that. But you're going to need to get all the way to the point where if you even have the slightest unwholesome or unwise thought that you cut it off and let it go and you don't allow the mind to stay with that complacency. And the way that you accomplish this is through practicing the enlightenment factors of investigation, energy, and joy which is what I just introduced you to and taught you. That investigation is examining the teachings, that you deeply study them. That's what's going to eradicate this complacency. And then you'll notice this energy and this joy springing up in the mind. So this complacency will keep you in that dull, lethargic state. You're not going to have access to the teachings. The mind's kind of lackluster, disinterested in practicing or even learning. So you're going to need to arise this interest to learn and then apply the teachings in daily life. Otherwise, you're going to be hindered or obstructed from getting to enlightenment. So let me know what questions you guys have here on either central desire, ill will, or complacency. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move on to the next two. These are the total of five where number four of the five hindrances is called restlessness and worry. What restlessness and worry is, is restlessness is where the mind is confused, distracted, having that restless state of mind. If you ever like tap your fingers, like tap, 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 or you have like a pin and you're constantly tapping the pin, or you're like bobbing your knee or, or tapping your foot, this is because the mind is restless. It's an overactive mind. The mind is the boss, the body is the employee. So the body is just doing whatever is going on in the mind. So if you're tap, 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 or you're bobbing your foot or bobbing your knee, this is because of the overactive mind. The body is just the employee. It's just following along with what's going on in the mind. So if you have this restless in the, restlessness in the mind, that's going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. So you're going to need to resolve that and fix that. And then the same thing if the mind's worried, where you're worried about your own unskillful conduct, where you're going to have missteps on the journey to enlightenment. You're going to learn these teachings intellectually, and you're going to understand what the teachings are. And you're even going to reflect on them. And you're going to see how true they are. But then as you're practicing them, you're going to have missteps. You're going to have challenges. It's not like one week or one month you're going to get to enlightenment or even one year. It's going to need dedicated effort to gradually work towards the goal. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have missteps. But if you can harness that 
by coming to a teacher, asking for help, you come to classes, you consult the books and you reach out and you get the help and you cultivate the wisdom that you need, then you can better ensure that you're not going to make those same mistakes in the future. So let's just say you do something and maybe another person is maybe 90% of the issue and you're 10% of the issue. Figure out your 10% and cultivate wisdom so that you can now make wiser decisions. But let's just say the other person is 99% and you're 1% of the issue. Still figure out your 1%. That by the time you get to enlightenment, you'll be making 100% wise decisions. And this will produce wholesome results in your life. So if you experience difficulties and struggles and you run away from that, if you shrink back from that struggle, then you're going to just ensure that it's continuing over and over and over again. So you would like to walk towards any struggles and difficulties that you're experiencing. Reach out to your teacher. Reach out to the resources. Reach out to other members of the community that you're part of this international community. You can make friends with various people and message them or call them and reach out and get help that you need to cultivate the wisdom to then make wiser decisions in the future. But if you have this worry about every single unskillful thing that you do, then it's going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment because you're going to make missteps on the journey to enlightenment. It's not going to be just smooth sailing. You're going to experience difficulties and struggles. So where you notice this restlessness or this worry, or another word for worry is anxiety. You might have this anxiety coming into the mind. Then what you do is you practice the enlightenment factors of tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. This is what I taught you with the seven factors of enlightenment. The tranquility is that peacefulness, the steadiness, the calmness. The concentration is the singleness of mind, being able to focus on a single object. The equanimity is the calmness and the composure, the evenness of temper. You're going to need to apply the effort to a arise these in the mind whenever you're noticing this restlessness and worried you're not allowing to allow, you're not interested in allowing the mind to just dwell in the restlessness and the worry then the fifth hindrance or obstruction is doubt this is where the mind has doubt about the teachings and the ability of them to attain enlightenment we're not just talking about generalized doubt like you doubt whether or not the cafeteria is going to be serving hot chocolate or not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doubt in relationship to the teachings of the Buddha. Like you doubt whether the Buddha existed, you doubt the teachings, you doubt the community, you doubt your ability of your teacher to help you get to enlightenment, or you doubt your own ability to get to enlightenment. It's common to have doubt when you come to the path to enlightenment. I know I had doubt. I had significant doubt. So you might doubt the Buddha, you might doubt his teachings, you you might doubt this community that you're part of, whether or not this community will be supportive and helpful. You might doubt your teacher. You might doubt your own ability to get to enlightenment. But you don't eliminate your doubt through belief, right? I shared with you at the beginning of class that it's not about believing a bunch of things. You don't eliminate your doubt through faith. But if you have doubt, it's going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. It's going to be an obstruction. So the way that you eliminate your doubt is through investigating the teachings, through examining them. That's how you eliminate the doubt. Because if you examine the teachings close enough, more and more, you're going to see that they're the truth. And as you practice them, you're going to be able to see the improvement to the condition of the mind. And as you're noticing that your mind's gradually becoming more and more peaceful and more joyful, you're noticing your relationships are really improving, that you're making wiser and wiser decisions, you're noticing more clarity in your mind, you'll get to the point where you've eliminated all your doubt about the teachings. You'll get to the point where you have confidence in the Buddha confidence in the teachings, confidence in the community, confidence in your teacher who's guided you to this mental state, confidence in your own ability to get to enlightenment because you're doing it. You're making your way to enlightenment. By the time you eliminate doubt, you won't be enlightened yet, but you will have seen significant progress. So it's through cultivating wisdom and acquiring wisdom that you develop the ability to improve the condition of your mind. And as you see that, you're going to build this confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, the community, your teacher, and your own ability to attain enlightenment. So you'll never see in the teachings of the Buddha where he says, just believe me, just believe me, just believe me. You'll never see that. There's no belief in anything whatsoever. You don't believe the natural law of gamma. You don't believe the cycle of rebirth. You don't believe the five realms of existence. You don't believe in any of these things. You don't believe the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. You learn them. 
you reflect on them to independently verify them, and then you practice. And this is what uproots the pollutions out of the mind, cultivating more and more wisdom. So if you have doubt, which oftentimes people do, you can harness this. You can harness it into an inquisitive mind. That's what I did. When I first approached the path to enlightenment, I had significant doubt. But what I did is I rolled up the sleeves, I sunk my teeth into it, and I was like, yeah, I doubt these teachings. Let me see if they're real. And I dug into them deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And as I did, I started seeing more and more truth, more and more truth. And I saw the condition of the mind improving and improving and improving. And that's where you eventually eliminate your doubt. And you'll get to the point where you have no doubt that these teachings are leading to an improved condition of mind. And that's through investigating the teachings and experiencing this improved condition of mind. So these are the five hindrances that the Buddha describes as hindrances. But he also talks about this other hindrance, which is the hindrance of all hindrances. It's called ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. We're translating it as ignorance, but nowadays that word ignorance is a derogatory term. It's a degrading term. And a Buddha and an enlightened being doesn't talk down to people. You're not going to be degrading and diminishing and disparaging to people. Instead, you're joyful and uplifting and positive towards other, other beings. But this hindrance in the mind called ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, this delusion or confusion or misunderstanding or this misperceptions that are in the mind. This is the hindrance of all hindrances. This is what's keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state that as long as you lack the wisdom of things like the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path, Five Precepts, Meditation Training and things like this, you will continue to experience discontentedness over and over and over again. So you need to cultivate wisdom to antidote that ignorance. So as long as this lack of wisdom is in the mind, you're going to continue to believe that other people are causing you to be angry and you're going to keep pushing people away. You'll be bitter, harsh and hostile. You'll put your expectations on people and try to control them or force them or pressure them to do things your way. And as long as your mind is lacking wisdom of the true problems, which is inside the mind and the true solutions to those problems, that ignorance is going to keep you trapped in the unenlightened state. So that's like the hindrance of all hindrances. So now coming to class like this, you're eradicating some of that ignorance. You're cultivating some wisdom by starting to understand the five hindrances. So you're always working to get to wisdom, no belief in the teachings of the Buddha. And that's what's going to ultimately eliminate and eradicate the hindrance of all hindrances, which is the ignorance or the unknowing of true reality, the misunderstanding and the confusion. So let me know what questions you guys have here on restlessness and worry or doubt. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section. I'll be able to see that and answer your questions. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Looks like Miriam has a question. If you'd like to go ahead, ma'am. You need to unmute yourself. We haven't gotten you unmuted. There you go. Sorry, <laughs> I was pressing the icon and there was a text to say. I couldn't find a button earlier, but I had a question about the, the first three that you presented. Okay. So for the desires, for example, you gave the example of the coffee. I stopped drinking coffee a long time ago, but I like the taste of coffee. I don't know mine. I mean, I, sometimes I order like coffee, ice cream, that kind of thing. So my question is something for the eyes for example uh i like traveling and when i see something beautiful i can appreciate it so i feel like is it too much to express i mean to feel like wow this is wonderful and then just take a picture and walk on i mean like is it is it bad or is it like too much already same thing with the coffee i can you know sit in like a Starbucks and, and spend half an hour there, like smelling the whole thing, the bakery and everything. I may have something or not, but I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make me act on it for like anything, but I have the feeling of, you know, wow, I, I love that. So yeah, my question is like, is it too much feeling already? Sure. So I don't think of things as good or bad necessarily. It's about what's wise or unwise. And what you would like to do is test the mind and see if there's these cravings. And the mind can crave anything and everything, even water. It can crave water. So it's not the object itself. So you're going to need to put the mind in various situations to kind of test it and challenge it to see if it's actually attached to any particular thing. 
But what you're talking about is what you would ultimately like to get to, where you can experience something and you can enjoy it, or the word you're using is appreciate it. You can appreciate something without clinging to it and holding on to it and getting conditioned pleasant feelings. So getting excitement or so happy based on the condition of something. So like mom's coming to visit you and you get so excited becomes mom's visiting, but then she calls and cancels the day before. Now you get sad or frustrated or irritated. When you see your mind going up and down like that, you know there's a craving desire attachment. What you would like to do is get to the point where when mom says, hey, I'm coming to visit this weekend, I'd like to come see you. You're like, all right, sweet mom, it'd be great to see you. It'd be wonderful. And then when she calls the day before and says, hey, sorry, I can't come. Hey, no worries. I understand. Whenever it works out, you know, I'll be here to spend time with you. That you're not disappointed or you're not missing her. This isn't the love that's causing that. It's the craving desire attachment. So all these different things that you have in your life, you would like to kind of test your mind by distancing yourself from some of them at different times to kind of test it to see if the mind is having craving, desire, attachment or the central desire. So you can kind of see if you're, you mentioned coffee ice cream, well, go to the ice cream shop and sometimes don't get ice cream at all. Don't get that coffee ice cream. Just go in with a friend, they order ice cream and you don't and see how you feel. Are you agitated? Are you annoyed? Are you frustrated? If so, you see you got an attachment to this ice cream and you would like to distance yourself from it more and more, eliminating the craving. But then once you eliminate the craving, when your mind can be just as peaceful with the ice cream as without it, then there's no harm in ice cream, right? You're not harming anything, particularly if it's vegan ice cream, you're not harming any animals or anything like that. So you would like to do this with your different objects because it's not the object itself it's how the mind's longing and yearning for it so there's certain things like a mobile phone that you know there's no harm in the mobile phone that you can have these various things in your life and you would like to learn how to enjoy them and appreciate them without clinging to them and being attached to them because that's going to produce the discontentedness okay so Actually, I never crave for ice cream when I have one. It's because I'm with someone who's having some. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'll have one. But I think I've been working on this. And without, you know, I, I discovered the, the work of the Buddha just like less than a year ago. But I think that I've been working on my feelings and stuff for like more time. And little by little, I, really, I came to the, the idea that I don't crave anything. And I, sometimes I even feel that I don't care anymore. You know, when my kids, like you say, you know, your mom wants to visit or my mom is far away. She can't travel anymore. But if my daughter says, oh, yeah, I'll come next weekend. And I haven't seen her like, you know, in months because I was in Thailand. And then, and then she said, oh, no, uh, well, I can come, you know, like for the next two weekends, so I'll come on that weekend. And she's not that far from me. She's like two hours away. But anyway, she has like plans. And now I, it's not that I don't feel anything. Okay, well, then, yeah, come, come like whenever you can. It's fine. Mm-hmm. And I'm afraid that, you know, I really am happy I'm going to see her at some point. I'm not that disappointed that she's not coming because she has like other things to do. She's young. She has like friends. I I don't know what she does. But at the same time, I feel like if I'm not upset or disappointed, maybe it means that I don't care. You know, I feel like, why is it that I don't feel? It's like dull. I mean, like the, the, I don't know how to explain it. I feel like, okay, well, like it's not important. (laughs) But yeah. it is. It is important, but I feel like, oh, well, next time. So what? how to deal with this? It's a strange feeling that I have sometimes. Like, it's it's bizarre. It's like I'm not happy. I'm not disappointed that she's not coming. I should be happy that she is coming. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it's a strange feeling for me to process. Yeah, this is the mind moving from central desire towards enlightenment, but it's kind of in the middle or not in the middle middle, but it's like kind of in the transitionary period of that where you're not used to this. You're kind of entering into this new mind and this new way of life where you've associated the disappointment 
and the missing your daughter as your love in the past. And this was because of the knowing a true reality, that lack of wisdom, where now when you don't have that disappointment and you don't have that disgruntledness, you're like, what's wrong? Because it doesn't feel normal. And I know exactly what you're talking about because okay. I experienced this right. too. This is, a, <laughs> this is a very common thing that you need to kind of, you need to get used to understanding that that disappointment and that missing your daughter is not the love. That's the craving desire attachment, but your mind is mm -hmm. still, your mind's still holding on a little bit. So that's why you're experiencing that like awkward feeling and that dullness. But if you keep practicing, you'll get to the point where you can maintain your joy and you can maintain your peacefulness. And it's like, of course, yeah, sure. You can come whenever you like. And you see that that's the love where you're not putting your expectations on your daughter. You're loving her as she is. And if she chooses to come, that's fine. You'll have a great time. If she chooses not to come, that's fine too. And you'll still be peaceful and you'll still be joyful. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you're just not used to it. So you still have a little bit of disappointment, you said, and that's because the mind's still holding on. There's still a little bit of craving in there. You need to be able to let that go more and more. And then your mind will brighten up where when she says, hey, I can come, you're like, all right, great, let's have a good time. And then she says, hey, I can't come. Okay, no worries, we'll get together another time. And you have the same brightness when she said she was coming and when she said she couldn't come. Yeah, I think for my daughters, I have three, because not that I was like a pushy, or, what, what do you mean, you know, you said you would come, I, I planned or something. I, I never said anything like this, but they may feel, I, I don't know, I'm thinking for them, but like, uh, they may feel like, well, it seems that she doesn't care whether I come or not. I don't know whether they test me or what, but uh, for me, it's like, it's almost like I am emotionless. I'm, uh, less. I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange, but at the same time, I don't know how it's perceived on their, their end. Yeah, the mind hasn't brightened up yet because you still have some pollutions. You got to keep working on, on the path to enlightenment, the Eightfold Path, to fully eradicate the pollutions. So you're in that transitionary period where you're coming into this new mind, but it's not fully awake yet. So that's why you're feeling that kind of like, ugh, kind of sometimes. But then in terms of what your daughters are experiencing, if they're concerned, if they are like, mom, why don't you like get upset when I don't come anymore? You can just tell them, well, <laughs> yeah. the reason why is because being upset was my craving, desire, attachment. That's not my love. So this opens up an ability for you to now explain to them what true love is, is that you love them as they are. And part of true love is allowing them to make their own decisions and not putting your expectations on them. And this is a great conversation and multiple conversations to have. So if your daughters are perceiving it in a way that you would prefer them not to perceive it. That provides you an open door, if they're open to it, to discussing it and helping them to realize that they can go through life where they don't miss you and they're not disappointed in you and they can still maintain their love. Like I'm getting ready in another six months, I'm going to be flying to Mexico for three weeks to have a retreat and some courses over there. And I, when I booked the trip, I said to my son, I said, are you going to miss dad when I'm away in uh, Mexico? He said, no. I said, oh, wonderful. So great. Right. That's great. Yeah, that's Because great. now he can be peaceful when I'm here. He can be joyful when I'm here and he can be peaceful and joyful when I'm gone. So I told him like, hey, that's really great. So he knows that he's been training his mind for a number of years now. But every once in a while, I still check in like that. Or sometimes I'll say, hey, you're having that sports game at your school. Uh, do you want mom and dad to come? And he's like, it's up to you guys. If you'd like to come, you're welcome to come and I'll have fun. But if you don't come, that's okay too. I'll just go and play and you can pick me up at school when I'm done. So we've okay. kind of checked in on him to make sure, right? So he's growing up this way. But you and I and your daughters, we didn't grow up this way. We grew up thinking that when you're missing somebody or you're disappointed that this is the love, but that's not the love. That's not even the care. So you can care about somebody without being disgruntled or angry or missing someone or feeling disappointed. You just need to learn how to do that. And the mind doesn't know how to fully do that yet because it's still in this transitionary period. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, it looks like Marcy, you have a question. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Teacher David. Thank you, Miriam, for your question. That was very, very uh, 
helpful. Um, Teacher David, I have a, had a situation and um, I'm having a challenging time trying to gain wisdom from it. So the situation was I have uh, elected to work only certain hours for my job so that I'm able to do my studies, both with the Buddhist teachings and also to get my RN degree. The other day, my um, employer called me and asked me to pick up an additional shift. I declined because I had already had established that, you know, I needed to dedicate a certain amount of time to study for a midterm practical. But after making this decision, the mind had some kind of attachment and was feeling some kind of guilt about declining the chef because it left a one of our clients um you know without coverage so i'm having a hard time getting the mind to balance the am i making a wise decision like I can see it clearly that yes, I'm making a wise decision because I have to dedicate time to the study, but then I have this, oh, guilt kind of like, well, you know, you could have pushed it off and you could have, you know, done it at another time or, you know, stayed up a little bit later to do it, to take care of this patient. So I, that's my kind of my question. I don't know if I'm being clear or not. I, I apologize if I'm not. Yeah, I understand. You're having craving, desire, attachment here. That's what's arising the guilt that the mind's holding on and wanting to take the shift or, or be there for the patient or be looked at as a very good employee or there's some kind of underlying craving, desire, attachment there that you need to uncover. What is it that the mind really wants? You know the situation that it's experiencing this discontentedness. So I encourage you to put the mind in this situation more that even if somebody calls you and you could take the shift, I would encourage you to politely decline so that the mind experiences not taking the shift until you get to a point where the mind can either take the shift and be peaceful and joyful or not take the shift. So maybe like take one or two or three and then even though you can take the fourth one, don't take it. Train your mind to okay. not do it. And this is going to put the mind in the situation that it doesn't want to be in and that it finds to be disagreeable. And now you're saying, hey, Mrs. Mine, you're going to learn to be peaceful and joyful, whether you take this shift or you don't take it. And I'm going to put you in the situation that you don't like being in. And you're just going to need to learn to be peaceful and joyful and understand that, hey, you can't permanently take every shift. You can't permanently be there for the clients. You can't permanently be looked at as a wonderful employee. Some people are going to look at you in other ways. So I don't know exactly what the underlying craving is based on what you're sharing. I mean, we could talk more deeply privately to uncover that. But nonetheless, you yeah. know the situation that's it's triggering that craving. So put the mind in that situation more until you get to a point where you've seen two or three or four times that it's peaceful and joyful when you don't take the shift. And then from that point forward, take the shift if you need to or and you can and then take the sh and don't take the shift if you can't. And then you'll notice that you don't have any guilt anymore because you've eliminated whatever craving was there underlying. And then, of course, you've got the consistent breathing, mindfulness, meditation and generosity going on. But you're doing this with the mind sporadically to train it to let it go. And so one 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 other one of my questions is is that the the my employer I I instantly noticed that she had discontentedness when I declined the shift and I could sense that bottom sensation of annoyance and I was able to cut that off. So I I could see that the mind can recognize it and be able to cut it off, but I've just got to investigate a little bit more to see where my attachment is mm -hmm. to that guilt. Is that what you're kind of like trying to explain to me? Yeah, you got to figure out what's the underlying attachment. Is it that you're craving okay. to be perceived by your employer a certain way? Are you craving to be with your clients? Are you craving the money? You know, you got to look at see it might be more than one thing, right? That the mind's right. holding on to. But also, mm -hmm. since you talked about, you know, declining and your your employer being annoyed or frustrated, I don't know if you've seen the class where I teach the art of the friendly no. I'm not sure how you said no to her, but I taught a class about mm -hmm. it. it's called the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no because there's 
knowing how the unenlightened mind works and that your employer is unenlightened and they're going to be having cravings for you to work, you need to learn how to use right speech to say no without saying no, right? <laughs> so that they can kind of get better, uh, so that you can get better results. So there's a class that I recorded recently as part of the Harmony and Relationships course that I taught in February. And uh, if you do the search for the art of the friendly no, how to say no without saying no on our YouTube channel, you'll find it there. And then I teach the students how to use that and build that skill because you're going to need to get more and more proficient with that because the unenlightened mind doesn't like to hear the word no. And you might get yeah. some people having painful feelings. You know that they're causing it themselves, but they don't know that. And they're going to attribute it to you and then they're going to push you away. They're going to be bitter, harsh, and hostile, or they're going to put your expectations on you. So you would like to try to avoid that if you can by being more skillful with your speech. And that's the class where I teach that. All right. Thank you, Teacher David. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, let me see one more time if we have any questions in Facebook or YouTube. Looks like Mayu Lee has a question here. I can relate to Miriam. Growing up, I rarely get excited for anything. Even now, my mind feels dull and lifeless. Will this eventually turn into joy? Absolutely. What you guys are experiencing is an indication that you're headed in the right direction. I don't talk about this when I'm teaching you the teachings because once you guys start telling me these things, I know that you're headed in the right direction. There's various things that you're going to experience on the path to enlightenment that we don't teach you because when you start telling us what you're experiencing, we know that you're headed in the right direction. So that dullness that you're experiencing, that's that sluggishness, the dullness. You would like to use the five, the seven factors of enlightenment to keep investigating the teachings, arise the enlightenment factor of energy and arise the enlightenment factor of joy. So stay dedicated to the Eightfold Path, keep working through it. And as you get more and more pollution out of the mind, the mind will brighten up. But you're going to go through a period of time, maybe like a year or two, uh, where the mind feels a bit dull, um, like almost like you don't care. And it's like it just doesn't feel the same way it used to because you're letting go of all these cravings, the things that you used to get conditioned, pleasant feelings with. You're letting all those go. And now your mind kind of goes into this dullness and this lethargic and you got to brighten up the mind with the investigation the energy and the joy where you find enjoyment and you start appreciating the things around you that it's not based in craving anymore that you can just enjoy going out with your family to dinner and when you go you enjoy it and when it's over it's over and you're done or you can go see an art exhibit and you can enjoy the art exhibit or you can go watch a movie our family went to see a movie today Kung Fu Panda 4 is out. I don't know if you guys know. So Kung Fu Panda 4. We went to watch Kung Fu Panda 4. Oh, it's nice. We got some popcorn. We had some drinks. We spent some time laughing and joking with each other. But when it was over, it was over. We got back home. We're just off doing our other things. So you'll need to learn how to enjoy these various things without clinging to it. But right now, your mind's still holding on a little bit. So that's why that dullness is in there. So as you keep training and stay dedicated to the Eightfold Path, the mind will brighten up more and more, but it's just going to take some time to keep working in that direction. And that's why you need to have that confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, the community, your teacher, and your own ability to attain enlightenment. Getting rid of that doubt, you'll stay dedicated and determined, and you can move through that dullness that the mind experiences. Everyone who's on their way to enlightenment is going to experience that. The way that I talk about it sometimes is walking through the fire to appreciate the fresh air on the other side. So you're gonna to have to walk through some of these painful feelings to get to the fresh air on the other side. So you're gonna to need to walk through the painful feelings to get to the peace and the joy on the other side where the mind's liberated and you're experiencing unconditioned peace and joy. But right now you're still experiencing ickiness in the mind. That's the way it kind of starts out with this dullness and then eventually that kind of diminishes and it starts to feel this ickiness, but more and more the mind will brighten up as you're getting closer and closer to enlightenment. So you guys are headed in the right direction. This is exactly what an individual will experience as their mind's making their way to enlightenment. Okay, not seeing any other questions anywhere. So what I'm going to do is in class, 
by thanking all of you guys who have been attending this program regularly, either through the live classes or the recordings, or even if you're just joining now and you're starting to come in at the very end of this group learning program and you're going to be restarting because on Sunday, the 17th, which is next Sunday, we're going to be restarting from the very beginning. I'd like to thank all of you guys for your dedication, your diligence, your determination to be learning and practicing the teachings from the things that I'm hearing, the personal guidance that I'm having with students. I can tell you guys are dedicated and investigating getting these teachings and you guys are making progress towards enlightenment which is really wonderful to see a large group of people like this gradually making their way to enlightenment and supporting each other as well so thank you all for your dedication your diligence your determination and thank you for your generosity because without your generosity i wouldn't have the support i need to be able to offer these teachings so if you've sent any donations or if you've helped me edit a podcast or here in thailand people buy me lunch and dinner and smoothies and coconut water and you know different things like this people help me with different things that i need either their time their effort their energy their resources i'd like to thank all of you for your generosity that has supported this program to be able to come into the world and share these teachings because it's the very best thing you could ever do is training your mind and making your way to enlightenment it's going to help you it's going to help those close to you and all of humanity so i appreciate all your kindness and your generosity and your support to help this program come to fruition and actually be shared in the world and as my dedication to you we're going to be restarting this program again next sunday i think this is the seventh or eighth time that i've taught this program we're going to be starting from the very beginning so you'll need a version of this book either downloading it from our website buddhadailywisdom.com taking it and go printing it you can get a printed version here at the temple in chiang mai by just reimbursing us for our printed cost or you can get a version through Amazon. A combination of reading the book and attending the classes, you'll be able to gradually build up your practice where you're meditating regularly and you're training your mind, and more and more it'll get closer and closer to this awakening. So thank you all for your dedication. We'll be starting on Sunday from the very beginning. This Wednesday, I'm gonna be doing breathing mindfulness meditation with students and opening up to any questions you have before we restart on Sunday. And then remember, we have courses and retreats all throughout the month and all throughout the year that you guys are welcome to attend. I'm starting to live stream all of those. I'm starting to open up Zoom for all of those. So anytime I'm teaching anywhere, trying to ensure that it's live streamed or and or Zoom is open, so you should be able to start seeing more and more and more classes that you're able to learn and grow and develop to make your way to enlightenment. And as you need help, always feel comfortable to reach out and let me know. You can post a question in our Facebook group, you can ask questions in classes, you can send me a private message, or you can schedule personal guidance. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee kap. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.